My second thought is that the, I think the highest leverage in the short to medium term is to focus on the supply side of the market. That is to focus on trust, on competence, on continuing education of financial advisors, particularly the ones who face customers. And, and I think all of these components are important. I think in, in addition, one needs to focus on incentives and alignment of incentives. Many of the private equity firms that I know um, try to align incentives with their limited partners by having very major stakes uh, in the thing. I'm not suggesting that it's a good idea to legislate that, but I am suggesting that pay atten paying attention to those things is an important part of gaining trust and confidence over time. It's also important to pay attention to conflicts of interest. Uh, many, many years ago, I wrote a book with Sam Hayes, who actually knew something about investment banking, unlike me. Uh, and we tracked the, the development of the major financial institutions in the United States. And one thing that was very striking was that Merrill Lynch, which was once a gigantic, powerful brokerage house, had leveraged that distribution capability to create one of the leading investment banks over a 10 to 15 year time horizon. Now this is sort of ancient history, but, but the point of all that is that, that one has to be very careful about leveraging the distribution capability if what you're mainly doing is acting as a broker, a financial advisor, and so on. That's a very, I'm not saying it's inappropriate, but it's a very delicate balance. Um, the third thing I wanted to say is that in the longer term, I think part of the solution to this problem of a permanent large gap between the ability to take advantage of the investment opportunities in a, in a rapidly changing global environment on the one hand, and what even an optimistic assessment of what the retail investor can pro probably know. The longer term solution to that seems to me something that Myron Scholes has talked about for several years now, and that is to try to create new products that actually solve people's saving and investment uh, needs. This is a fundamentally different mindset uh, from teaching people how to do it themselves or do it reasonably competently themselves. I'm thinking of products with different intertemporal profiles of risk and return than you can find in the underlying asset classes. In effect, what, 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 what one can imagine doing is using the underlying assets along with derivative uh, securities, insurance contracts, and so on, to, to do things like limit the upside or the downside potential, provide downside guarantees, embed insurance and other things in this, make liquidity provisions for people in case of adverse shocks, tail risks hedging, and so on. And one of the things I, I, I learned painfully, and then a number of other people who are more sophisticated than I learned painfully, is that hedging is not something that you'd sort of do and then go home. <laughs> Um, it's a continuous sort of activity like trading, and this is something that, you know, the retail investor can't do. We have the tools to do this. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out what the, the customer, the investor, really wants and then tailoring the products uh, to do it. We know how to clip tail risks. Uh, we know how to protect against fat tails. Uh, some of this is going on. Annuities are an example of it. But I think we've only just started down the journey of going this route where the expertise that's required is contained in the product itself, uh, the risk management and all that sort of thing so that the consumer doesn't have to sort of do that on their own, um, in their own living room, so to speak. To some extent, that's what hedge funds do, do, do now. Um, but I. I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think, as I think, try to think about it logically, I can't see how to close the gap between the investment possibility set on the, on the one hand and the retail investor on the other, that gap being cr created by knowledge and expertise without some approach that sounds like this. 
And finally, the fourth observation is that the challenge is not just to create these products, but to create, uh, to market them. And, and I think we've now heard several times, including from me, that that's going to require trust. People aren't going to be able to directly assess what's going on inside those things, so they have to, they have to learn over time that these things have been well constructed, that they actually work, experience supports that, and so on. It takes time to do that. And that's why I put this on a sort of longer time horizon. Having said all that, let me just say a few words about the retail investor, him or herself. What, what are the key things they need to sort of understand or th be able to think about at least in general terms? Well, one of them is income statements and balance sheets. When I became the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, you know, a small institution in Boston, um, I asked for the balance sheet <clears throat> of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. This produced consternation beyond belief. And after about a week and a half, somebody came in with something that I can only describe as a tissue with two numbers written on it. And I, I said, is that the balance sheet? And they said, yes. But we clearly didn't have a balance sheet. Uh, we didn't have anything that looked like that's what we owned. Um, I, think, I think we have to be able to teach people about risk and return and about diversification uh, so they understand that concept. And I think they need to understand that diversification isn't just about asset classes, it's about managers. You mean people who are employed uh, to serve them. They need to understand that the importance of shifting asset allocation with things like age, because your time horizons are changing. Um, these are old ideas, but they're not widely understood in the population. They do need to understand something about liquidity and flexibility. Um, they need to understand that timing markets is a bad idea, that most people don't try to do that, and when they do, they don't do it very well. The most sophisticated investors in the world will tell you that they may try to time markets in the most general sense, but they don't try to do it with any great degree of precision. People need to understand that chasing yield is a bad idea, and it usually comes with hidden risk. And that now occurs within asset classes that are no longer homogeneous with respect to risk. I think that behavioral economics it will actually give us opportunities in the educational area. Behavioral economics and finance is starting to deepen, considerably deepen our understanding of what, how people actually behave in the face of risk and what kinds of mistakes they make, and that may form the basis of some fairly targeted education um, that's important. Um, and finally, I'll close with this. I, I believe that the main entity in the educational process has to be the industry itself, in part because that's where the expertise lies, and collectively, that's where the interest lies. Uh, people are going to pay attention to this at the appropriate time in their life, and it, that's probably <coughs> young adulthood. And there are big, big opportunities here. Uh, you have the internet, which young people use routinely. Um, you have very interesting uh, uh, available technologies, I'm thinking, that, that, that do things dynamically in such a way that people really understand them. I'm thinking of Gapminder. Uh, which was developed by a chap in Sweden and is now used to explain all kinds of things. Uh, it's very dynamic. You could, you could use it to, to help people understand the kind of intertemporal aspects of risk and return and so on. Um, I just think we haven't, under, we haven't exploited this yet much. Um, and finally, I think the press can do a great deal here uh, by flagging uh, educational opportunities by talking about the, the issues. Um, but it's going to be challenging. I mean, the starting point is, I think, distrust and, uh, and lack of confidence and a fairly low level of general education. But I'm very much looking forward to the, um, the discussion that's about to come, and so I'll stop there and say thank you.